You are listening to the Reraceables podcast. Hello and welcome to the Reraceables podcast 43 for season 33, episode 9. I'm your host, Tom. Excited to be here tonight, accompanied by two of my favorite people, Nicole and Lizzie. What's up, everybody? Welcome in. Happy Wednesday. Feels good. We're at the penultimate episode. Season 33, and we're How much do you like saying penultimate? It's a pretty damn good word, and it's a perfect way to segue into our fill-in-the-blank shtick that we're doing here. Penultimate's a fun word to throw in. What we're going to do is we're going to have four statements, and we're going to just read them out loud, and when each we're going to go around each person, and they'll fill in the blank with a word that fills it in best, or an imaginary word if they so are inclined to make one up. And... Let's have some fun with this. So here we go. Number one, the final four being Kim and Penn, Raquel and Kayla, Dusty and Ryan, and Arun and Natalia is? Miraculous. I say that for multiple reasons. First being that it's miraculous that they pulled it off. They started, they stopped, they got to the final four, but mostly it's miraculous that um, Arun and Natalia somehow are in the final four after being eliminated, what, four times, basically? Yes, yes. four um, lives. So it is miraculous that they made it to the final four. My answer is predictable. <laughs> you know, my, my top three in the power rankings were Kim and Penn, Raquel and Kayla, Dusty and Ryan. Uh, so we're exactly where I wanted to be, where I thought we would be. So predictable. So it's front loaded is what I would say. This final four of Kim and Penn, Raquel and Kayla, Dusty and Ryan and Rune and Natalia is front loaded. Obviously, there's been two different groups in this final seven, the second stage of the race with Kim and Penn, Ra- Raquel and Kayla and Dusty and Ryan being the consistent one, two and three. And thus front loaded is why I went uh that was what I filled in the blank there number two an alliance between Kim and Penn Raquel and Kayla and Arun and Natalia to target Dusty and Ryan would be amazing but being that I'm hoping that Dusty and Ryan win I hope that does not happen um but you know what Recently, team to beat has been Kim and Penn. So perhaps maybe an alliance needs to be made against them. And what would your I word be for that? Strategic. Strategic. Lizzie? My word for this um, fill in the blank that I 100% understand is spicy. It would be spicy if that happened because we have seen little to no drama on this season. And I think it would be so fun if something like that happened. Good word. Yeah, I think an alliance that targets Dusty and Ryan would be best practice. It would be in their best interest, I think, despite the strengths that we've seen from Kim and Penn, three straight first place, despite, despite the strengths we've seen from Raquel and Kayla, despite some of the bumps and bruises we've seen from Maroon Italia, I still think Dusty and Ryan, at the end of the day, in a race where there are so many things being controlled, and it literally could come down to a sprint or a climb up a mountain mm-hmm. or something physical at the end of the day, you got to beat them. I still, I still believe they're the strongest team. So I would think it would be best practice. Number three, Arun and Natalia making the final three and advancing past into the next, into the finals with a chance for a million dollars is? Bananas. The shit is bananas. That would just be bananas. I don't know what I would do. I, I don't know if I would be happy. I think I'd probably be disappointed, but I would like be happy for them because what a comeback story. But either way, it would turn this race up on its head. And I think it would be bananas. My word is unfair. I just, at this point, I don't think it's fair that they're there. And like, like how great would it have been if it was Sherry and Akbar? You know, they, they overcame so much 
each week. Arun and Natalia, they just got lucky. I don't know that they're as deserving. I still think it would have hit us differently if we would have seen the speed bump and we would have seen the penalty assessed to them. I still think that that would have left a different taste in our mouth going forward here, but I would fill in the blank with freaking crazy to quote, to quote my man. It's crazy. <laughs> Tip of the cap to them. All you have to do is beat one team. I think they've proven that that is definitely the, the best mentality to go in the race. And no matter what, they have a chance, right? Wrong, indifferent, fair, unfair, COVID, whatever you want to say, they do have a chance. And it, it makes it fun, honestly. It's, it, I think it's made it more fun. It's kind of given us, like Lizzie said, a, a less drama-filled season, at least from the race week in and week out standpoint. It's given us a little bit more stuff to talk about. Last one. MVP so far through eight episodes going into the final four is? Penn. I think it's Penn. I think he's got... The physical ability, the mental ability, good teamwork. He's he's just a complete package. I agree. Wow. I say Penn. Uh, he's been on top of that funny, personable, lovable. You see how much he cares about his wife when he was crying, when she was doing the, uh, what's it called? The bungee jump. Bungee jump. Musical. Yeah, he's creative as hell. He's. He's super smart. He's, he knows his strengths and his weaknesses. I think he's definitely been the MVP so far. My vote is, um, is Penn all around. Three raceables, big Penn stands. Oh, he's, so fun, he's so fun to watch. Like, you can't help but root for their team. Um, and I feel like Penn is a, just like a big part of that. He's such a presence, not just because he's, you know, tall, um, but because of all of the reasons that you guys just said, and he, you know, he makes you want to root for him and wouldn't, you know, it, we are. So yeah. MVP goes to Penn. And I don't think Kim, uh, is a slouch by any means. I think she's been no, excellent no. as well. She compliments him well. Clearly. Yeah. I think it's very clear aside from their YouTube presence and obvious kind or maybe conspiracy theories as to why they got cast. I think it's pretty evident why they make a great team to cast. They're fun. They clearly love each other. They know each other. They support each other. Strengths, weaknesses is pretty apparent. And they've been like, I think they've been probably one of the more fun teams, if not the most fun team to watch. All right. Well, that, that's it for fill in the blank. Hope we had fun with that. We're going to jump into episode nine. Only this episode and next week left. I'm a little sad, but we'll, we'll pause there for now. And we will be back on the Reraceables podcast. Stay with us. This commercial break is brought to you in part by tribalcouncilblog.com. Be sure to visit all of our social media websites. And give us a like or a follow or a subscribe. And don't forget to out like, out comment, and out share the rest. Thanks for all your support. Welcome back to the re podcast, episode nine in the books, season 33. I want to start with Lizzie. Lizzie, you brought up a point about the editing and how it portrays Arun and Natalia. And why don't you throw that question out to everyone? Yeah, so um, I bombard uh, this group with my text messages so that I can remember what my thoughts are during the episode. And um, my last one is... Um, I can't tell if the amazing race editing has painted a not good picture of Arun and Natalia or if they have done that to themselves. I feel like I feel like we get a lot of them yelling at each other and putting each other down and being like, Dad, why didn't you do this? Natalia, hurry up, come on. Like they're like, no, you need to break the plate like this. No, you need to break the plate right here. They're so hard on each other. And it does not paint them in a good light. However, I know Arun is also very like, go Natalia, whenever things go right. And so I, I want to give them that. But I feel like more often than not, we see the like editing where it's them fighting, which, you know, I guess traditionally speaking is more fun to watch. It remains a mystery to me whether or not they really are just like that or if The Amazing Race is kind of 
pushed that storyline a little bit bigger. I think they've faced more frustration than the other mm-hmm. teams, which lends itself to more yelling and bickering. And like the other teams have that bickering, but we don't really see it as much. In terms of the editing, I just thought we should applaud Amazing Race editors because this episode was what we were talking about. The last episode was missing. We're like, at the very end, we didn't know who would hit that map first. Would it be Dusty and Ryan or would it be Arun and Natalia? And it made it much more exciting to watch. Yeah, I was sitting there and I was like, no, it's got to be Arun and Natalia. Dusty and Ryan have been there for like two and a half hours. And then I'd be like, well, ah, and I just, it was fun. Right. It makes me wonder, back to your point, Lizzie, the Arun and Natalia storyline. I think they just have a lot of weaknesses. I think navigating is a weakness. I think coordination and overall like athleticism is a weakness. Communication is a weakness. Communication, right? They're the father and daughter. There's a natural different dynamic in that relationship that Kim and Penn obviously have a very different way they can talk to each other and communicate with each other. Even the other two teams and, being friends and being closer in age. And like, I think there's a give and take that like Ryan exemplified beautifully. Like he could see Dusty was at the point where he was so frustrated and the anger and the rage was just building and building. And he knew in that moment, he's not going to do well. So he had to pull his friend out of it and say, take a break, come up here, look at this view, take a breath. And in that moment, that is what his friend needed. And it's- Prison perspective yet again. It's, yeah, it's, it, it wouldn't have helped if he was yelling at him, no, you already saw that section or why aren't you doing it this way? Or, you know, criticizing would not have been helpful. Brian was very Yoda, very amazing Buddha, even just so Zen in that moment, knowing what his role needed to be. So unbelievable, uh, unbelievable, really. I definitely wouldn't have reacted that way. No, you would have been the raging lunatic. <laughs> yeah. So uh, speaking of raging <laughs> lunatics, Dusty, I think that's the other major storyline to come out of this. Dusty really, I think we cut into his core more so than maybe any other character throughout this entire season. And I think reality TV shows like this, like Survivor, the best characters or the best connection we feel with characters is when we get to see these deeper pieces of them. And in this episode, we really get to know and see Dusty's battle with his rage his attempts to overcome it, his shortcomings when, it, when dealing with it, and his bigger purpose. He's very interesting in that way, in contrast to, for example, like Kim at the beginning of this episode was in the car, and she was like, you know, anxiety is something I really deal with, and it's something I work on every single day, and they, you know, explained that I'm doing the best I can. She's repping the merch, which I kind of want to buy, and that's something that they talk about, and 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 Penn is and he and she what did she say she was like and at the at the end of every day Penn knows that I'm doing the best that I can and so she's very open about her anxiety, um and that's something that's talked about. However, it doesn't take a challenge to push her to the point of anxiety for her to like talk about it and acknowledge it. Where I feel like with Dusty, it did take him. He was pushed to that point to talk about it, and I feel like. That's what makes me think it's something that's still kind of new for him that he is still working on and that he's not as open about talking about it. And we could get into the whole like men versus women talking about their feelings thing, but. Which is a bigger deal, which is more pronounced, which seemed more authentic. Kim's anxiety talk, Dusty's battle with rage. It seems like Dusty's battle with rage seems more authentic because we got to witness him being pushed to that point but I think Kim is just more well-versed in talking about it. I feel like she knows how to handle it. She knows how to talk about it. And that's why she was 
able to in such a calm seeming way, but anxiety is also a mental illness. It's like not something that you physically see, you know, with rage, it's easy for that to be external. And with anxiety, I feel like a lot of times we don't even know that people are anxious because it's so internal. So I wouldn't say that one outweighs the other, but I would say that I'm glad that both were brought to light because I think it's good for both to have airtime, I guess. I would have, yeah, go ahead. also learned ways to cope with it to the point where it doesn't have to get to the point where she's boiling over and there's an ex- dramatic expression of it. I would have liked to have seen her after three hours, though what her anxiety would have looked like. And that guy would have talked, uh, told me a different thing through the screen where I don't care who you are. Turn over those damn stones for three hours and see if you're not dealing with something at that point. Yeah, I agree with Nicole wholeheartedly. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to watch something on TV that's external and nobody can read mine. So I, I, you know, I applaud Kim for being so open and honest about, that that she's dealing with and I applaud Dusty for being open and honest about what he's dealing with um it was just uh, like you said Tom to even spark this it's it was just interesting to watch the progression of it for him so her anxiety and that whole conversation comes in the drive to Thessaloniki let's talk about navigating as we know we're watching the show they don't have GPS they don't have a cell phone that they type in, Theatro, whatever, Disastro, whatever the name of the place they have to go to is. And then boop, it just doesn't, that's not how it works, right? Instead, there's a map, a old school, like 1995, how you would have to travel, or even, I don't know, maybe much newer than that. And a compass. I think it was Kayla that was the best example of seeing her literally with this big map on her lap in the back seat, a compass flipped up. How would that go for everybody? Well, I was thinking about this. Was it last night? We were looking for the restaurant. Yes. Yes. So last <laughs> night, <laughs> I looked up some restaurants. I was in the mood for Mexican, saw their website. I even went to their Instagram to look at like their food, see what I wanted to order. We put it in our Google Maps. And even with Google Maps, we couldn't find it. (laughs) Well, that's not true. It showed up. (laughs) There was a little icon that popped up on the map. There was directions. It was in the area we we were. It had a phone number. We called the phone number. Somebody answered and... And sure enough, the restaurant closed like a long time ago. Six years ago. (laughs) (laughs) So it was a failure because we were looking for something that didn't exist. But I was thinking like, wow, even with GPS, I still can't find where this place is. And like, looking at a map and trying to figure out wait which way am I facing and then like having the blue turn arrow turn (laughs) around and like trying to figure out well then wait if I'm facing this way but it's pointing this way where do I have to go like even with that technology I struggle so having a 2d map and reading it and having greek words instead of english and I would have a very hard time with this. <laughs> I think it'd be the, to the point that I would have to navigate and you would have to drive. Yeah. Because I would have, to, I could not rely on just driving or we would have to pull over, both look at the map. This is probably a better strategy. Both look at the map, both understand where we need to go. Both understand what keywords we are looking for. Both understand where the major highways or roads are on the map and have an understanding where we both are and create landmarks and everything. And then, and only then proceed forward and like take that five to seven minutes or whatever it takes in order to know where we're going, because how easily, even with huge technology, failure of navigating can happen and can only imagine what it would be like with a map and a compass. 
Yeah. Insane. I, um, I, I hate to brag, but you know, when I was a Girl Scout, I was really good at, um, navigating with the compass and a map in our, um, Girl Scout camp. So I can't help but think I would be just really good at it on the amazing race as well. I say this sarcastically, kind of. Um, but I do think I would agree. I think Josh is the kind of, per- I, for some reason, whenever we talk about the amazing race, Josh is in the driver's seat and I'm navigating. And because I am confident in my navigation skills, but I agree. I think he would appreciate being in the know and having like a, a, some sort of mental image of what the map looks like just so he can also get a, a lay of the land. Um, I think that would make us a stronger team, even if we took, you know, like you said, two or three minutes to just kind of be like, okay, and this is this, and this is North, and this is this. He's definitely the kind of person that's like, are you 100% sure about that move? And, you know, when you're in the middle of Greece and you can't, and nothing's in English, it's hard to be like, yes, I am 100% sure because no, nobody doesn't ever know anything what's going on. So um, and think about think- this too. How often do you navigate with your partner, whoever that may be, and whatever that relationship is, with them in the back seat and you in the front seat driving, or vice versa? Never. Nobody drives like that. Nobody picks up their friend or drives with their spouse or their daughter or father with them in the back seat. This is an Uber. Like the world doesn't work that way. People get in the front. That's what happens. To your point, if though, like if, if suddenly tomorrow Phil called and he was like, Hey, you're going to be on the amazing race. You leave in one month. I absolutely, I would start sitting in the back seat and I would make him sit in the back seat and I would practice that because not only is it, you know, the added pressure of being on the race, but that's a new experience for a lot of people. So the more you can eliminate new experiences, like that's why people learn how to drive stick shift. That's why people, uh, I don't know, learn to swim, to, to go on this. I feel like something like that would be very brilliant to think about. Amazing. I never would have thought of that. I'm glad that we've unearthed that. I'm glad we turned that stone over. And speaking of turning stones over, you see what I did there? We get to the first roadblock as Lizzie rolls her eyes. Uh, (laughs) We get to the roadblock. Who's willing to leave no stone unturned? You have to find a gold coin under a stone and there's literally 5,000, I believe is the number that they throw out there. And it could have easily been more who knows i have a lot of questions about this roadblock because this was the most dominating part of the episode but let's start here at the beginning because i want to take this in sections at the beginning what's the best strategy i had a couple i wrote down like one section at a time i think kim said that Uh, making landmarks do you remove the rocks do you keep them there do you flip them back over what's the best strategy from the beginning when you first get there let's say when you're who's first there kim what's the best strategy i would not do like only the external and then like spiral in try to break it up into chunks and do like this slice of the pizza then the next slice then the next slice because I just think it's too risky to spend all your time on the external first. Your strategy, in other words, is don't just take one circular region, but cut through the center. Cut through, yes. Lizzie, best. What's what's the best strategy you can think of from the beginning stage? Well, before I would even come up with a strategy, I would want to understand the parameters a little better, and I think this is just you know being a viewer. Um, we don't know if they weren't allowed to throw rocks out. We don't know if they weren't allowed to completely flip the stone over and then leave it like that. Because I remember catching a lot of people, like they would flip the stone over, look at it, and then put it back down the way that they found it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, like if you were all trying to help each other out, maybe you like flip over all the stones and you leave them flipped over. But, um, I guess starting on a strategy is that what you want to do because then you're helping other players and that gives them an advantage of your work but if you're all doing that then maybe that is what you want to do so um i guess i would want to understand a little bit more if you know the rules based on what we know what what do you think what would you do 
I would agree, I would agree with Nicole. I would go by section. I would go by chunk. It feels natural to kind of flip everything around in your arms radius, and then move a couple of feet, and then do the same thing. What doesn't feel natural is like crawl around the edge and mm -hmm. flip over things along the parameter. So, um, I think by doing that, you might have the best odds. I don't would know. you flip it back over? Like if that wasn't a rule, you could potentially flip it and then like toss it, or you could flip it and flip it back. What would you do? Absolutely. I would flip and toss. I would get that shit out of there because mm -hmm. if I wasn't going to trip up on it, like, or if no, if any, no one else was going to trip up on it, I was going to trip up on it again. It's like at some point, I don't care if it's helping someone else because right. then we'll all get out of here faster. Yep. You know, it's it's just like, and they all seem to get along, so I bet they would be fine with that. Maybe past seasons, the rivalries and people they hate, I don't know. I think people would go out of their way to make it harder for other teams, but not this season. I'd like to think that at the beginning, I would just scan the whole thing. I would look to see if there was any fake looking stone or something that just kind of stuck out that didn't look like the other ones. Because it looks like there was flat gray ones, there was small gray ones there was rounder more orb like kind of white yellow and ones. yellow whatever brown in there but then the one that they kept hitting into that kim actually touched i think raquel's foot hit it that was all white and it's like okay if they're gonna put it i guess they don't know and that comes back to your point about knowing the parameters do we know if, if the language of it is that the coin is under it or in the rock I don't know. I would have assumed that it would have been under the rock, not truly in the rock. So I don't know. I maybe even would have missed it because I, I, depending on the interpretation there and again, knowing exactly what you're getting involved with. But right. I'd like to think that I would skim the whole thing looking for something that just kind of sticks out straight out of like Shawshank style where <laughs> red at the end goes to the rock wall and where Andy left the rock that doesn't belong there and he pulls out the chessboard and the money and whatever but it was hard I, I think that there is no good strategy and I think that kind of proved that frustration tension anxiety whatever you want to call it really settled in pretty quickly if you're because you're not able to do that quickly I think what I would have done though is I, I would not have like picked it up and tossed but I would try to make some marker, indiscreet marker for myself that I've looked at that one. So maybe I like make sure that I shift it so that it's touching the others and make like a subtle pile. Taking advantage of it being round, mm -hmm. maybe think of it as a clock with the woman as the 12, and then the other from there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Pick a rock, put it as the center, and just from the woman to the rock. And then do that next line to one o'clock, to two o'clock, to three o'clock, to four o'clock. Something yeah. to try to create a structure. I, I'm channeling my Josh here. To create a structure within that space. To allow yourself to check off boxes. Because I think the worst strategy you could have is just randomly picking something without any rhyme or reason yeah we saw we saw dusty get to that point and i think that's about when ryan was like okay come here <laughs> at what point do you say okay a break is needed for example when i do like a crossword puzzle there's a certain saturation point where i can't see an easy clue a hard clue i, I can't do it anymore and I have to physically remove myself. And when I come back, something that was hard, I'm able to get. At what point yeah. do you think is that point in this challenge? I don't know. Probably when one rock doesn't look different than the other rock. Even when, when you started, they were, they were clear differences. You have to give yourself a break and, and give yourself fresh eyes. I feel like anything that monotonous is gonna like make your eyes glaze over and not only that but like the strain on your body like Kim was saying like her back was hurting Arun's knee was hurting so it's a strain on your body too that you don't quite realize until you get up and you're like oh. I think the time to do it is when the first one is found right if you aren't the one who finds the first one when somebody finds it you need to a take a break b 
look at the rock that they found, meaning walk over to them, see what it looks like so you know exactly what you're looking for. Three, or C, what did I say, letters? C. C. <laughs> Under, you'll learn from all of that. D, look at the rock. Is it an actual rock? Does it have a uniqueness among the sea of rocks? Which that one looked like it was pretty white, not like the other, a lot of the other ones. And then maybe you start searching for an all white rock and you just disregard the gray ones. I don't know, maybe that's a decent strategy from the beginning or after the first one, but at least you get some information from that first one kind of reset to try to go forward i think whatever strategy makes you feel like you're making progress is the right one for you funny thing that happens during the challenge kim acknowledges the the amazing race sound that when you're right near something but you miss it and it's that doo -doo -doo -doo. i mean this is why <laughs> she's an internet sensation right this is all credit to kim she's clever as hell she's funny as hell and I just love how she, in that moment, is able to assess that she's probably living that moment that she's describing. And then what happens? She does. It happens, it happens to her. She touches the rock that has one, and she doesn't turn it over. I think she had her whole hand on it. And it turns out that Raquel is able to find that one and channel her inner meditation and good energy to help her get there. But let's ask this question at this point. Did the right people do this challenge? No. Kim, Raquel, Dusty, Arun. You're both shaking your heads. Lizzie, what do you think? I think there was a good answer in both Kim and Penn. I think they both would have been good at it. So I'm fine with that choice. Um, I think what we were both shaking our heads at is that it should have been Ryan and it wasn't. All that prison patients am i allowed to say that i don't know but yeah, it would have really it's the truth we've 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 hit on the prison it would have come in handy like we've all acknowledged it they acknowledged it on the race and it's just kind of like i don't know what they were thinking when, <laughs> when they chose. i said right away to tom when we were watching dusty's too impatient for this remember yeah yes but i yeah. feel like it, his rage could have and was probably as best as it could be channeled for the good of this challenge where he could Tasmanian devil through as many, he would go through each rock quicker, but maybe not have the patience to develop a better strategy that other people would have had. But I disagree. I think his rage worked against him. I think when you get that mad, you're less focused on the task and you're more focused on your frustration so I think the longer that he sat in his unhappiness and his not finding the, the golden coin, the worse he got at the task. And that would not have happened to Ryan. Dusty is Charlie Bucket. He's the last one to find the golden coin. Kim was first. Raquel was, oh, excuse me, Raquel was first. Kim was second. Arun was third. Dusty was fourth. Right, so Raquel finds the first one. And it seems like shortly thereafter, Kim finds the second one. After one, or probably it's a better way to look at it, after two have been found, how does the strategy change at that point? Because there's only two left. It's you versus the other person. How does your strategy change, if at all? I would probably assess where that person is looking and think about where were the two that were found placed and avoid looking in those areas because they're probably not gonna stick two right next to each other. So consider that in choosing the chunk that I am assessing. So create a landmark, mental note. Okay, this is where golden ticket number one was found, golden coin number two was found. Stay away from there and then keep going. What about you? Lizzie, what would you what would you do after the first one or the second or the first two were found? I don't think I would have changed anything. I think that I would have stuck with my for Nicole's example, I would have stuck with my pizza slices or my clock. Thinking big picture is where I'm coming from with this. When they run the race, 
it gets worse for them when they think of others too much. It's the whole idea of you run your own race. And if you're so worried about other people, you're going to lose track of where you're at and you're going to not be able to focus. And so I think that same sort of, you know, strategy applies to this just on a smaller scale. If you're so busy thinking about what other people are doing and where they found their rock, then you're not going to be as focused on the strategy that you started out with. You might lose your place with the strategy that you started out with. And I think it's um, a little bit maybe losing trust in the thing that you set out to do on your race. They're running their race. You run yours. Are you all in the same arena? And does it seem like a high stakes situation because there's so many rocks and uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, it does. But I, I would challenge a person to stay mentally strong and stay true to the path that you were on because I, I, you start a strategy because you trust your own instinct and that's what's gonna work for you. So if you adjust that based on what other people are doing, I think you worsen your chances. I mean, it comes down to, at that point, especially the parameters of the challenge. What can you do? What can't you do? If you can start throwing rocks out of the circle or throwing them at all, that's a huge change because then I'm just whoosh, everything. Nope, gone, gone, gone. I'm shot putting as many rocks out of there as possible. You know, especially the little tiny ones, just whoosh, 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 like just trying to eliminate as much as possible or trying to do anything I can to kind of cut down on the number of it. And I know that that's something we don't quite know. And we'll have to ask one of the teams that participated, but I feel like that's the only strategy you can really do. Cause I think your point is sound Lizzie, like you have to run your own race. And as much as if I'm competing against someone and they're looking over there, maybe I should look over there too. Even if they turn the rock over, I grab it first. Is that a sound strategy? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but Ugh, my heart broke for Dusty when that last one didn't, he's the last one. Oh my goodness. Could you imagine just having. And for three hours. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Brutal. I mean. Did you get the feeling that. They got gloves on. Even and... after they found it, they kind of gave up a little bit. Yes. They weren't. They were kind of like with the plates, I feel like they could have gone faster. But again, why are they, why are we getting that feeling? Because they spent three hours. Yeah. And at some point. I feel like it just got to a point they knew they were in last and they wanted yeah. to finish. Yes. But they knew they were in last place. Yeah. And the whole Ryan tagging him out and having him come up and look at what where they're at ground him yeah awesome moment just an awesome friend to friend moment but also a we know we're going to lose yeah and like so thank goodness moment. they finished because they ended up non-elimination leg right of course and we'll get to that in a little bit but i think at some point too as horrible as it is to swallow your pride or your rage or depending on who you are and understand that it's it's about not giving up and as much as that's easy probably for us to hate on because we're viewers and it's like you kidding me it's a million dollars like fight 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 no there's a certain point where you've been there for an hour and everybody else has been gone and what are you left fighting for and it's for your own pride and not giving up and for Dusty teaching his son or showing his son a model of who he wants to portray as a father, as a role model to his son is admirable. And I am so happy that they were able to accomplish that. And he came away feeling that. Before we move on from this, I want to ask one more question about this. What do you think it was like for the four people who are not turning the stones over? Oh my God, it seems like torture. I, I know, like, um, you know, if, if you have an empathetic bone in your body, you would just be dying for your partner that's out there flipping over the stones. And I'm sure, you know, some people would be wondering, you know, what would I be doing better or, or how could I, maybe it should have been me. 
you know, having thoughts like that, um, it seems just horrendous to sit there and watch that person you love to <laughs> just struggle so much. And the artificial, you're doing great. Yeah. You're so good. <laughs> you got this, Dad. You got, you got this. this dad. Yeah. <laughs> if you were saying that to me and I was out there in the trenches failing. I wouldn't be saying you're doing great. I think I would just say it's not over yet. Like something constructive. Not, yeah. you're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> you look hot. <laughs> but what can the person from the crowd do? Well, you're right? not allowed to help. You can encourage uh, but you can you also do, annoy everybody else and make their experience that much shittier. I guess that would be helpful if you knew it wasn't going to make your partner's experience worse. Correct. Because my, if I was sitting on the sideline and Josh was over there flipping rocks, I would not want to make it worse for him. Even if I wanted to make it worse for other people, I would need to find a way to do that that didn't also drag him down. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just saying... We get it. Would You'd that, sit there. We, would that caught? Yeah. No, I, I maybe I'd be like, your butt looks great. I don't know. <laughs> so who would do this? You or Josh? I think it'd have to be me. I don't think Josh would get to like a dusty point, but he absolutely is not as patient as I am. <laughs> yeah. I think Josh would be happy to let you do this one too. Yeah. And you know what? He would be great on the sidelines and he would have that he energy would be. and he'd He'd be a great cheerleader. Yes, he would. He be. would. He would. You know, so I, you know, more power to him. I'd want him to be quiet, <laughs> but I wouldn't <laughs> stop him. I wouldn't stop him from doing it because I know that would make him feel good. I think either way, I would be having a miserable time with this. <laughs> if I was searching and I was failing, I would be so angry. And if I was sitting there watching you struggle, I would be so angry. Yeah. I think hindsight's 2020, but I would have been better suited, I think, to do this because I would have been a very destructive person in the crowd for that reason. I know that's not a great reason. I think I should have done it. I think I am way more patient and you would have gotten frustrated if after the first person found it, you would have lost it. You would have blown up and- I don't know. I, yes. I, I think you are, you're giving the viewers quite a uh, different picture of me than- Viewers need to- Tom, you've already acknowledged that you would have done something like that in this episode <laughs> of this podcast. You've already acknowledged that. Viewers need I think to I, know. No, I, I think it would have been worse if I was in the crowd though. I know that doesn't necessarily mean that I should have done it, I still, I am not disagreeing. I think you would have probably been a better because you're more patient than I am. I think I would have created a better system for finding the rock than you would have. I don't know. Do you disagree? I mean, I had a strategy. What was your strategy? Yeah, I would have had the same type of thing. So why do you think you just said you're better than me though? Because I just, I know I would have come up with a better strategy and the physical piece of it too. I mean, that would have been hard. This is the point where you ask, what is the best for our team? Not what am I best at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's hard though, because I think I admire Ryan. That's what I'm getting at. I admire Ryan, his ability to just sit there and be Zen and coach Dusty through it. I just, I know I couldn't have been that and I couldn't have been, phony baloney artificial you're doing great i would have had to have in that moment channeled my inner strategy guy and just be like okay this is final four nicole what do you need from me that you'll be able to tune out but everybody else will hate and then i'll make everybody else we'll just be the villains in this moment it's final four ride or die on that 99 would have made good here on the wall 99 <laughs> It would have made good TV. I don't know if it would have been the best move for your team, but would have been good TV. All right, let's go to the next part. <laughs> <laughs> they have to go find, I believe it was Socrates. And we have some dramatic acting. He was very good. 
the eye acting was very good. See, if only I was able to find that editing and put that out, Lizzie, I would put that on there. I liked how Kim was writing down everything he was saying, but it like actually didn't matter. I thought it was going to come back and Phil would be like, you can step on the mat when you repeat to me what Socrates said or something like that. I thought they'd have to regurgitate it because it was relatively easy to remember. It was short. However, um, maybe in like the finals, they'll have to say what was Socrates's words of wisdom for you. Very good. Wait, let me see if I can come up with it. Let me see if I can remember it. There's only one good knowledge. <laughs> knowledge. No one evil, ignorant. Yes. <laughs> wow, very good. I like how everybody just kind of <laughs> didn't know how to react. Everyone to the guy. was just like <laughs> hanging on every word. Did I mean, you like... hear? Did, did you hear? Did you hear Ryan? The two of them stood there because they were so defeated. <laughs> the guy finishes and he goes, "Ignorance." <laughs> Ryan goes, "I agree." <laughs> I think it was Penn and Kim were just like in his face, just trying. <laughs> I, I felt like Penn was holding the back. Silver Kayla and Raquel, <laughs> they were also just like. But holding back, <laughs> bursting out laughing in the guy's face. Yeah. I really, because I would have probably burst out laughing right in his face. <laughs> You know what? I have to. I have to appreciate an actor or someone who was hired that gives one hundred percent with their role. I so appreciate that. Yeah, that guy was amazing, and I think you're right, Nicole. We'll put a little feather in that. I think that's going to come back at some point in the finale. Thank you. Moving forward, we get to the detour. But we had bring them and break them. In bring them, you had to carry 300 plates up a hill to a cafe. In break them, you had to listen to a band play, and as they played, you got the break plates until you found the little teeny tiny two-inch two inch clue to go to the pit stop. Seemed like there was a pretty clear... Easy choice. This was a no-brainer. No-brainer. Obviously, you do break them. First of all, Everyone had rage and everybody wanted to just <laughs> break those plates because they just needed a release to the frustration that they felt. But I think also it was just an, in the descriptions, it was an easier challenge. They didn't have to make sure that they didn't break anything and transport things from one place to another or do this long trek up a hill. It's just stand in place, break, 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 break. Maybe that's why they had the clue be so little is because the Amazing Race knew this was going to be easier. And so they were like, let's do one minute thing to make it a little bit challenging. I think that's the other piece of why this is the obvious detour selection to make. When else do you get to break 500 plates? Just smash, start break, like turn on Limp Biscuit and just start breaking stuff and just start smashing 500 plates. Never. Who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. It's like if they had a, a demolition of a car challenge where you just got like a sledgehammer and you just got to beat the shit out of a car. Like who would not choose that? <laughs> Everybody would. Breaking windows, smashing rear view mirrors. Like people would love, people love that. People love to break stuff and release that. Or as Kim and Penn said, it was less celebratory, more rage. Rage, a very a big thread through this whole episode, a little theme there. Arun and Natalia somehow though, find a way to complicate this, it seemed. <laughs> they found a way to like, yeah, bicker throughout the whole thing. It's truly incredible their abilities to do this that's what i'm saying like i just feel like they struggle in coordination right this doesn't seem hard right like even no. raquel and kayla they come up with one two one two right, fine a cadence great kim and pen they pen was just having fun kim was just pissed off that works dusty and ryan i saw ryan uh, dusty like this with like his one arm and he was just like limiting his motions just so he was most efficient and then he even said i'm going to turn the plate and smash it on its side because then it breaks apart even more so 
and then Arun and Natalia are. I felt like the Samurai it. weren't even really looking very hard. No, they were just trying to break as much as they possible. They were just break, and that's where I go back to like, were they really doing their best effort, or was it just get through this so they can move and make it to the end? Hard to say. I also wonder though, what is there a penalty if somebody just took all five hundred and just tipped the whole damn thing over? I'm sure you couldn't do that. But what's the penalty? Probably, Two hours. Probably, yeah, it probably was like a, on the clue. It says break the plate one by one or one by one. Like that. True. True. And it's such a fun challenge. Maybe it's better to break it one by one anyway, because again, when else are you doing yeah. that? But you know, it's like that kind of thing when you don't follow the rules, you get all the way to the mat, and Phil says you didn't do this right. You have to go back and go do it. You know, mm -hmm. that would suck more than anything. Yeah. So you have to kind of channel again, that rage productively, especially for the teams that were frustrated at that point. But the clue on the little teeny tiny one inch clue said white tower, which was to bring everyone to the pit stop at the white tower in Greece. And they may be eliminated which is big because this was a non-elimination. Up until the non-elimination, we see Raquel and Kayla coming first and win a trip to Hawaii. Best reward so far. Very jealous. We're big Hawaii people, but the Sheridan and Kauai, a helicopter tour, a luau, a private chef. Sheridan, Kauai, if you're listening, we'd love to sponsor you. Excuse me, we'd love them to sponsor us. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have the money to sponsor you. Which Kimmy Fan came in second. Again, strong, but it ends there. Uh, three leg winning streak. So that ends there. And then we have, again, as we said at the top, the editing battle royale of Arun and Natalia getting lost, trouble navigating. And then Dusty and Ryan finally getting past the stone unturned and breaking the plates. And literally you had them going and approaching the White Tower from opposite sides. It was so dramatic. You got to love that. Kudos to the Amazing Race production team and whoever's editing it behind the scenes. But Arun and Natalia tie their best finish. They finish third. And in last place is Dusty and Ryan. And as we said, it's a non-elimination. What do you think for Dusty and Ryan going forward there? And you're starting after Arun and Natalia. 15 minutes doesn't seem like that much. I feel like they are good navigators. They'll make it up like that. I agree. I also just want to uh, be happy about the fact that this non-elimination leg did not go to Arun and Natalia. Had Dusty and Ryan come in third, like everyone thought they were going to or higher and had Arun and Natalia come in last, we would have rioted. <laughs> we, we would have been <laughs> so mad. Last question. We have the non-elimination. Dusty and Ryan are out, but they're not non-elimination. Which team do you think is the most pissed to see them walk in to wherever they're staying that night? And no, oh my God, it was a non-elimination. Who's most pissed, do you think? Kayla and Raquel, mm -hmm. absolutely. Agreed. You remember after they were done kayaking down the crazy nature trail and they were like, came in before Dusty and Ryan and they were like, yeah, let's end their streak. They were so excited to beat the boys. And I'm sure that they were thrilled to have seen them come in last and devastated to hear that it was <laughs> What and they said, also are really out. vying for that girl team to be a winner. It takes a unique team of women to do that. And I think that's cool that they're really vying to become that. And I think from the beginning, we all kind of saw that in them. And that's clear that they are. I really feel capable. like it could be with exception of Aruna and Natalia, because I don't think they have what it takes, but I think everyone else has what it takes. They could all potentially win this. It could be anyone's game, with exception yeah. of Aruna and Natalia, sorry. That's an exciting last episode to go into. You know, it's no fun if you're like, obviously these people are gonna be the winners. Um, so it'll be a good two hour episode, I'm excited. 
and we'll be back next week to cover it all. Looking forward to it. Hopefully we'll be able to plan something out with everybody to get the whole crew together for the finale. Two hour finale. Thank you all for being here for another episode of the Reraceables podcast. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate you all being here. Be sure to follow us on all our social media accounts. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Be sure to like and subscribe to that. Just go into YouTube, search Tribal Council blog. You'll be able to find all of our episodes of our podcast from season 32 and season 33. Everything thus far, as well as some other content from the blog on Survivor. We have a Survivor 42 coming up after the finale of The Amazing Race 33. So excited to get that going, but definitely want to close out The Amazing Race season 33 beforehand. Thanks for everybody for your support. Be sure to out like, out comment, and out share the rest. The blog has spoken. We'll see you next time. Thank you.